Well, good morning, church family. I hope your summer is off to a fantastic start. Uh, Mine has been incredibly busy. We have a lot going on around here. As you can see with Vacation Bible School coming up, more than 700 uh, uh, children registered, more than 230 volunteers. So church family, you have stepped up. Uh, I can see a lot of the VBS shirts as we, we are getting ready and also just had Two teams returned from the mission trips, uh, from mission trips this week, and uh, hearing those stories, I had uh, my wife and two sons went to Yucatan, Mexico, and uh, uh, they were changed uh, because because God moved, and and they came back just just on fire for the Lord, and so uh, yeah, praise the Lord, right? Uh, the fact that we get to step out and be the hands and feet of Christ and, and that we get to go, we have the gospel and we have the resources. Guys, it's why we do our mission uh, fundraiser lunch every year so that, so that people can go. Let me put this charge out there. I've said this to you in the past. If you have not been on a mission trip in the past five years and you are physically able to go, you got to go. We, we have a lot of different mission trips that, that we offer, some of them uh, domestic, international, lots of entry points. You need to go, okay? Start planning that now because there's, there's going to be a, a mission trip uh, interest, uh, lunch and those things coming up in the fall, but just start planning. It, it is so valuable. And if you can do so as a family, oh my goodness, do that, do that. Awesome. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. We're going to continue our walk through uh, the life of Joseph. Uh, and this morning, uh, I mean, Joseph's in the pit, right? So, you, you know, the, the, the topic's going to be on affliction and waiting on the Lord. Did you know that John Bunyan, the, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, Did you know that he suffered greatly? In his personal life, his oldest daughter was blind, and his wife, the mother of his four children, uh, died. He had recently remarried, and then the Church of England arrested him and 2,000 other pastors for preaching the gospel clearly and teaching nonconformist doctrine. So there he is in prison away from his new wife and four kids. Now he had particular compassion on his little blind Mary, of whom he said, oh, the thoughts of the hardship. I thought that my poor blind one might endure, would break my heart to pieces while he was in jail. Now after three months of being in prison, his uh, heroic wife went to the judge to petition for his release, to which she said, my Lord, I have four small children that cannot help themselves, of which one is blind, and we have nothing to live upon but the charity of good people. Now, the state would let Bunyan go if he would simply stop preaching the gospel and conform to the state's doctrine. But Bunyan's reply was, if I were out of prison today, I would preach the gospel again tomorrow with the help of God. And so he stayed in prison for 12 years. Now, while in prison, he wrote... uh, Many of the works that he is famous for today, that we have today, including Pilgrim's Progress, one of the most published books of all time. This morning, as we pick up our story with Joseph, right, and he is in the pit and now the dungeon, uh, we are going to be forced to look at waiting on the Lord and the way that God even uses suffering and affliction in the life of his children. 
Would you pray with me? Then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we, we love you and uh, we love your word. Uh, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people. So you are here with us. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would take the circumstances of Joseph's life and allow us on the other side of the cross not only to understand for ourselves, but also to understand it through the lens of the gospel, to understand that, that you are a God who has entered into our suffering in order to save and in order to bring about life and redemption, that, that God, you are a God who is worth waiting on, that we trust you and we, we believe that you will cause all things to work together for our good, even as we wait, even as we don't understand. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So to reset our story, we remember that Joseph started out as the favored son of his father, uh, Jacob. But on top of that, God began to reveal himself to Joseph through dreams, that there were plans that God had for the future, God's plans and what God was going to unfold. He began to reveal that to Joseph. But as Joseph shared his dreams with his already jealous brothers, that turned into hatred. And they devised a plan to kill him. So one day they throw him in a pit. But according to God's providence, their plans change. And instead, they sell him as a slave to Egypt. Now, as Joseph goes to Egypt, again, by God's hand of opening and closing and moving doors, he gets purchased by the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard, Potiphar where Joseph excels as a slave, as a servant. He works hard. He, he proves his own worth and value. He, he doesn't sit around and wallow in self-pity and resentment and bitterness. Rather, the Lord's favor was upon him. Because the presence of the Lord, Joseph took lemons and turned them into lemonade. You ask how did Joseph not become bitter, resentful, full of self-pity? Well, the text is clear. It was because of the presence of the Lord. Instead, he became a hard worker, successful, productive, because of the presence of the Lord. And Joseph became Potiphar's favored servant. And he was promoted. He became a blessing to Potiphar because of the presence of the Lord. Now, Joseph's promotion led him to oversee the whole of Potiphar's estate, and it led him into the house where an evil temptress awaited Potiphar's wife. But don't worry, Joseph was righteous. He told her plainly, no. He avoided her, and, and further, he fled when one day she came with aggressive in her sexual advances. And what did Joseph receive for his righteousness? An accusation of rape and being thrown into the dungeon that Potiphar oversaw for, favor, for Pharaoh. He didn't get his own defense. There was no fair trial before a jury. He is a slave. He has no rights. Simply Potiphar's sentence upon Joseph, life without parole in the dungeon. You see, for the second time, the favored one has been thrown into a pit. Now, let me give us a time frame for us to understand these events. 
You see, Joseph was 17 when he was first sold into slavery. 17. I mean, just, just a mere boy. Can't even grow a good beard yet. And when the events of chapter 40 start, Joseph is 28. Guys, that's 11 years. Now, we don't have the breakdown of how long he worked for Potiphar and how long he was in the dungeon. But let's say that the first eight years that he worked for Potiphar, right, he worked his way up from the bottom. He rose from the ashes. He worked hard because God's presence was with him. But now, because of Potiphar's wife and her evil intentions, he has returned to the pit in the form of an underground jail for three years, maybe longer. And when we come to the end of today, we realize that he's forgotten in jail for two more years, right? And you're thinking, good grief, two more years? Upon the assumptions I've given, you're talking about five years in an underground dungeon. Joseph is 30 when he comes out. 17 to 30. 13 years. The best years. And upon my assumption, five years in a dungeon. Yes, we read in at the end of chapter 39 that, that Joseph was favored, that God's presence was with him. That that he rose up in the dungeon to become the leader there with the other inmates. But come on, let's let's talk about waiting on the Lord, right? I mean, the reason that Joseph's story is given so much space for us here at the end of Genesis, right? It's this long story format. Is because you and I are to consider the difficult themes that it introduces. And one of those is waiting on the Lord. Now, I know half of you cursed me under your breath as soon as I said that. Believe me, I don't like waiting any more than you do. No one has ever said of me, you know, Jason, you just exude patience. (laughs) Right, no, guys, we like control. Okay? We like our plans. And now, please. But God's timing is not our timing. And the Bible is full of the idea that one of the great tools that God uses to shape our character, the character of his children, is waiting on the Lord. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. And in his word do I hope. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. Hear me clearly. I believe that Joseph is actively waiting on the Lord. You see, there's a difference between begrudgingly waiting, growing bitter waiting, and actively waiting on the Lord. Now, again, this is over a long period of time, all right? So there's plenty of room for all of Joseph's emotions and his his doubts and his moments of self-pity. But I genuinely believe that every time his heart sank, Every time he was reminded of of how he was wrong, every time he remembered how much he had lost, God's presence came in a fresh, new way and lifted his head. And now Joseph is actively waiting. Now, don't get me wrong. He wants out. But he's actively waiting. To actively wait is to say to the Lord, I know that you are better, and God, you are enough. 
God, you are my portion in my current circumstances, and you are enough. God, I believe that you were working all things out for my good, but God, I believe that you are even better than the good that you will bring of this. The blessing that's on the other side, God, I believe you are enough. It's one of my favorite terms in the whole of scripture. God, you are my portion. You're my portion. Nothing makes you take inventory of personal sin like waiting on the Lord. Nothing will break your pride like waiting on the Lord. Nothing will make you surrender control like waiting on the Lord. Now we're gonna get to see the fruit in Joseph's character on the other side. You see, only the potter knows when the vessel is done, not the clay. All right, so in Genesis 40, we're 11 years into this. Joseph is 28. Let's pick up the first three verses in Genesis 40. Then it came about after these things that the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. Now the cupbearer is in... That's an interesting position that we don't think that much about these days. But he tasted Pharaoh's food and wine before every meal. That was for Pharaoh's protection in order to see if it was poisoned. Now this job had its perks, but there was one drawback. Maybe it was a tiny drawback. Say bye to your wife in the morning. Let's hope no one... Tries to poison Pharaoh today. But consider the position a little more with me. Because he also had the responsibility of the quality of food and watching Pharaoh's diet. If something was off, he wouldn't serve it. But also think about the closeness of the position that came with being the cupbearer. Sharing portions of a meal and time every day, going with Pharaoh everywhere he goes. You see, he is highly trusted. This is a highly relational position. Recall with me, Nehemiah was the cupbearer uh, for uh, (coughs) King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah, as we find out, was a very wealthy man, and he he was a very good leader. He was very powerful. In fact, his closeness uh, to the king led to his commissioning of going back to Jerusalem to build the wall. Nehemiah was sad one day, and because they had a close personal relationship, the king pried out of Nehemiah, why are you so sad? He told him about Jerusalem and going back and building the wall, and then he gave him resources to do so. So this cupbearer is a pretty prominent position. Now the cupbearer also worked hand in hand with the king's baker. Right, that's his top chef. We understand that. And here we are told, <coughs> excuse me, that both of them, assumingly in the same event, have offended Pharaoh to the point where he throws them in jail. He's furious. Now it's possible that Pharaoh got sick off of something, or maybe had guests with an allergy that they messed up and completely embarrassed Pharaoh, or or maybe they had a, a large party gone bad. Whatever the case, they have offended Pharaoh, and he is furious. And wouldn't you know it, they are both thrown into the same prison where Joseph is. Now, do you think God had anything to do with that? Now, what I know about situations like this is These guys have their own side of the story, right? How 
how they didn't do anything wrong, how, about how they're being treated unfairly, unjust, how they should not be here. And wouldn't you know it, God brought them to Joseph, others who were going through the same circumstance that he was. Verse 4, the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them. And they were in confinement for some time. Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? So catch the scene. Because here is Joseph, free of bitterness and self-pity because of God. And what I want you to notice, Joseph has something to give. I mean, if you compare circumstances, who's had the harder go here? Okay? Joseph has way more problems. He's in, he's in on life without parole for something he didn't even do. But Joseph isn't worried about comparing circumstances. He's not singing his own song. Instead, he has something to give. Right? He's, he's put in charge of them, and yet he's sensitive to their needs. As he interact, like as you're reading this story, you're like, Joseph is ready to minister to them. To take the comfort and strength and life that God has given him and give it to others. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that we are to take the comfort that God gives us in our affliction and give it to others in their affliction. I mean, isn't this encouraging? Doesn't this call you forward? Right? If Joseph and his circumstances can be such a servant, wow, can have a ministry in, in jail, in a dungeon, he can have a ministry there, then I guess God can use us anywhere, can't he? Verse 8, they said to him, we have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. <clears throat> and then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell it to me, please. Now, not all dreams are from God, but these two are. This may be a glimpse of how God has encouraged Joseph through the years. Right previously, we're told that Joseph had dreams, but here we're told that God had given uh, Joseph the gift of interpreting dreams. Now, again, as we read the narrative, I want you to notice how little the text highlights Joseph, but how much Joseph highlights God. Right? It takes us back to last chapter in verses 21 and 23, and the Lord was with Joseph. Now, in verses 9 through 11, the cupbearer gives us his dream, tells it to Joseph. He's in the middle of the night, and he sees, three, he sees a grapevine that has three branches. And growing on those branches pop up giant grapes. And he, the cupbearer, is holding Pharaoh's cup. And he goes and he squeezes the grapes into the cup, and then he gives it to Pharaoh. Verse 12, then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation, the three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will, be, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cup bearer. Only keep me in mind. When it goes well with you, keep me in mind and please do not let a kindness by mentioning me, uh, sorry, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. 
And even here, I have done nothing that they, have sh- that they should have put me into this dungeon. <coughs> Guys, Joseph is hopeful. Do you hear that in his voice? He begins to connect the dots in his mind. This is what God is up to. The cupbearer is going to remember me and use his powerful position to get me out of here. Joseph doesn't just see it. He asks for it, right? Remember me. I bet Joseph couldn't sleep for weeks with anticipation. Well, the baker hears the favorable interpretation of the dream that Joseph gave to the cupbearer, so he decides to give him his dream. He said, I had three baskets of bread on my head, and one of them has all sorts of really good food for Pharaoh. You think, all right, that's starting out pretty good. But then birds came and started eating out of the basket on my head. Uh Uh-oh. If you have a dream and birds are eating out of your head, that's not a good sign. (laughs) Then Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. Three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh off of you. All right, so again, not all dreams are from the Lord. So if you have a dream where birds are eating your head, it may not be that bad, all right? But this one was bad. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all of his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into, uh, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Everything happened just as Joseph interpreted. You know what? This proves that he is someone who knows God, that he is someone who walks with God. This is the test of a prophet, right? If your prophecies come true, guess what? You're from the Lord. So here's Joseph. You got to be thinking, man, this happened just like I interpreted. He can't sleep with anticipation. He knows that cupbearer is going to tell Pharaoh he's going to be released anytime soon. Verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And if you look at verse one of the next chapter, now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. He forgot Joseph. He forgot him. Sometimes the Lord uses networking. Joseph sure hoped that he would because he had shown his character. He had shown that, that, that he was kind, that he ministered to them that the presence and favor of the Lord was upon him. And then there was that three days of this powerful push of remember me. When you get out, remember me. I've been put here unjust. I was kidnapped. I didn't do anything wrong. I've been righteous. Remember me. But the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. You see, in this story, For God's purposes, it must be known that no one lifted Joseph up out of that dungeon but God. Here, God was not even inclined to use networking of a favorable situation and kindness. You see, it's not until the hand of the Lord is forced that Joseph Uh, Sorry, it's not until their hand was forced that Joseph was remembered. That was all God. Now, remember how I said at the beginning that the story of Joseph and the end of 
Genesis is given to us in long story form. There's so much attention given to it. And that is for us to consider its difficult themes. And the first one we talked about was waiting on the Lord. Well, another one is suffering and affliction. This story smacks you in the face where you're like, two more years, God? Two more years. <laughs> you couldn't have sped that up any? How much lower must Joseph go? Betrayed by his own brothers, into slavery, entrapped by the master's wife, but he was innocent, and yet into a dungeon. And now, two more years? Two more years. <laughs> now I say to you this morning, we have to say, come on. Let's talk, about, <clears throat> let's talk about the unfairness that occurs in life. In this room. Let's talk about situations that you have endured that are downright from your perspective unfair. Undeserved mistreatment by a family member. Some of you have endured great consequences, great suffering because of relationships within your family that you didn't deserve. Untrue accusations that have led to very serious consequences, possibly losing a job. Sudden injury or debilitating disease. Maybe it wasn't sudden. Maybe it was from birth. Abandonment from a parent, a spouse, <coughs> a husband leaves his wife and children to fend for themselves. They are alone. Situations in life that are unfair. Joseph's story forces us to take a sustained look at that's not fair. God's ways are not our ways, His thoughts are not our thoughts. His timing is not our timing, and his plans are not our plans. With our short period of time left, I, I want us as, <clears throat> as believers to move forward in our mind to the New Testament. Because as Christians, we understand that the Son of God came to suffer and to die for our sins. Consider with me the ways of God that no one has ever suffered as much as the Son of God. Salvation. God brought about salvation through the affliction of his Son. And as his disciples, we are told, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. Let me give you another passage. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 25 is on the screen, but I, I want to summarize the two verses before it. Peter says, For this finds favor with God when you suffer unjustly and patiently endure it. Suffering unjustly and patiently enduring it. Okay? That's the context. And now he says, in fact, believer, you have been called for this purpose. For the purpose of what? Enduring unjust suffering. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, 
And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. In other words... When you and I patiently endure unjust suffering, okay, the circumstances that we've looked at with Joseph, completely unjust suffering, when you and I patiently endure that, we are walking like Jesus. And no disciple is above his teacher. I want us to focus back on that for you have been called for this purpose. I want to bring in one other verse, tie them together. Colossians 1.24. Paul writes and says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church. <coughs> In filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. In filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now he's not making, he's not calling Christ's afflictions, uh, not, uh, he's not questioning the worth of them. And he's also not calling them insufficient. But what is lacking is the knowledge of Christ's afflictions. So catch this, what you and I are to understand as believers is that suffering and affliction for the Christian is by design. In order for us to walk the path of Jesus, by design, take up your cross and follow me. It is by design as a witness to a world that does not know Jesus' own afflictions. So again, consider the ways of God, that Jesus' afflictions are for eternal life, salvation. God gave his son who endured more suffering than any human ever, and on the other side of that, is eternal life. But the lost world does not know. They have not trusted. So what can they see? Our blessedness in affliction. Listen, everyone knows how to rejoice when things are good. Like the A&M baseball team. I mean, you knew I'd figure out how to weave it in there just a little bit, right? But seriously, think about it. Members of that team or fans who are close and and following, we have some church members that sent me pictures yesterday that said, from the field, that said, I don't think I'm going to be in church tomorrow, all right? (laughs) But when things are good, you know what those players are going to say? This was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Right? Greatest experiences of... They, that's easy to rejoice. Everyone knows how to rejoice in that. But when we rejoice in the midst of suffering, if we endure injustice and do not become bitter or full of self-pity, then those who do not know Jesus' afflictions, they must take notice John Newton called this the burning bush effect. You remember when when Moses drew near to the bush and said, why is that bush not burning up? Well, because God was there. So it is so. When believers are enduring suffering, when they are going through circumstances that should cause bitterness and self-pity, And a lost world looks on and says, why is she not burning up? It's because of Jesus. It's 
It's because Jesus is there. Amen. It's because Jesus is there as a witness. So, beloved, hear me in closing. We, we are not called to go looking for suffering and affliction. But when it comes, but when it comes, we are to understand that it's actually God's plan to be a witness for his son. So that you will say, it is enough for me to be like my master. It is enough for me to be like my master. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I, I know this is a heavy word on our hearts this morning. It, it, is, it is your text, and it is a truth, a reality of life, that here we, we will suffer, that to walk with you, we will endure persecution, that your ways are so different from this world, that you use even difficult things to shape us and to shine your light for your glory. We pray to that end because I know all across this room that there are people who have struggled mightily with some unfairness in life, some things that don't make sense, Father, I pray that we would learn from Joseph's story and this text about how your presence, your favor, is the only thing that allows us to overcome. And King Jesus, you, your spirit is in us and allows us to overcome allows us to, to have things make sense even when they don't make sense because we trust that you will use this, even this, for our good and your glory. We believe that in Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, the praise team's gonna come lead us in one final song. It's an opportunity for you specifically to respond. If God's spirit has spoken and this has touched a particular nerve, I, I, I pray your obedience, your willingness to respond. I can't tell you what that looks like. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you if you need someone to pray with. If you came in with a burden, uh, please don't carry that on your own. Allow us to carry that together, okay? Uh, would you stand and would you sing in faith?